Mm. All right, good morning. That coffee is still really hot. <laughs> All right, uh, man, I'm thankful that you guys are diligent to be faithful to be here this morning, despite the weather. Like, you had every excuse and circumstance to not be here, but you didn't. And so I thank you for that. So, from the bottom of my heart, thanks for being here. Because you're being faithful to the Lord when He's called us in Scripture to not neglect the assembling together. And so, thanks for being here for that. Um, if you've been following along with us for the past couple weeks, uh, you'll know that we've been uh, hammering Christmas. We've been talking about Christmas for three Sundays now. And by the time this is said and done, you'll probably be really tired of Christmas. But I hope not. I hope not. Because it's so rich. Like, this is, this is the Super Bowl of Christianity. And Easter is like the World Series. Like, you can't, you can't mess this up. This is the biggest event in the course of human history. Like, the two largest scale events in all of human history are the birth and the death of Jesus. It's a big deal. And so we want to spend as much time as we can really focusing on all the details of Christmas. And so... We've been walking through the Old Testament, uh, and so we've been, like, we finished our series in Nehemiah, and after we finished Nehemiah for the past two weeks, we've been looking at big-time stories in the Old Testament that give us such a clear, pointed picture of Christmas and Jesus. And so, we're going to continue that today, and then we'll wrap up uh, with the Old Testament stuff next uh, next week, and then we'll finish off on uh, Christmas Eve that Sunday morning, really diving into just the story of Christ. Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna focus on that. And so just a little a little um, refresher. Two weeks ago we looked at Genesis chapter three and we looked at the fall of mankind. And though that may not seem like a Christmas story per se, it is because in the fall of man in Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve sinned, God in the darkest time in human history, when all hope seems lost, as He lays down the curses on the serpent and the woman and the man. He gives a promise of hope. He gives a promise of hope. Because when he curses the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the offspring of the woman, and you shall bruise his heel, and he shall bruise your head. As we talked about, that in that very moment when all hope seemed lost, and man had sinned, and it seemed like that there was no connection with God anymore, in the curse, that he says, man, there's one coming as a virgin. And yeah, you're going to tempt him and bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head, and the, the Savior will win. There's a promise coming. And then last week we looked at Numbers chapter 24 and Isaiah chapter 60 and Micah chapter 5. And we looked at these three stories and saw how they all point that the heavens and the stars will give us a glimpse of the coming Savior. Right? We see that they talk about this star that, that raises and shines up over all creation and brings light to the darkness. And that out of Judah will come this star and it shall rise and it will have a staff and it will rule all things. Then we looked at Isaiah where it talks about that people will come from far to worship this king. And they'll bring gold and frankincense. Then we looked at Micah chapter 5 and it says, There is one who is coming who will be born of a virgin and you shall see his signs. And how that is all fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2 when it says, that These wise men saw a star in the east and they traveled across and they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. And they fulfilled this prophecy of the Old Testament. And we know that the goal represented the glory and majesty and kingship of Christ. And we know that the frankincense is what they would offer in the temple when they worshipped the Lord. It would be this fragrant offering that would burn day and night in the temple as worship. And these wise men brought this to Jesus. And we know that both of those were prophesied, but myrrh wasn't. But they brought myrrh. And then we saw that myrrh is actually a prophecy in itself because myrrh is an embalming liquid that they would use to perfume dead bodies. And then when Jesus dies, it says Joseph of Arimathea pulls his body down and prepares it with myrrh. And that in his birth, it pointed to his death. We looked at that great, great quote from the Anglican pastor that said, The birth and death of Christ are but morning and evening of the same day. It's all tied together. And that the stars literally align to point to the birth of the Savior so that mankind would have a record of this, so that we could understand that God came to us. So that's what we've been walking through for the past couple weeks. And so today, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at two promises that Isaiah gives us in chapter 7 and chapter 9, and how that's fulfilled. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn over. And in case you were wondering, there are 15 days, 12 hours, and 10 minutes till Christmas. Not that anyone's counting. The 10-minute part might actually be off. I was estimating. 
via the calendar on my computer a couple days ago. I'm trying to figure out exactly like when the service would be happening. So there's at least 15 days and 12 hours until Christmas. See you there. Um, so if you got your Bibles, uh, you can go ahead and flip over to Isaiah chapter 7. We're starting Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, you don't have to flip to everything uh, as we go. Um, it'll be on the screen, hopefully, if technology serves as well. Um, so if you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them up. Uh, and I'm going to pray in order to read the Word. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your house. God, we thank you for the fellowship and community of the church. God, we ask that we would never neglect gathering together, praying for each other, caring for each other's needs, taking care of one another, worshiping you together. God, we ask now as we open your word that you would teach us and you would grow us. You would open our minds and our souls to uh, just develop us into who you want us to be and conform us to the image of your son, Jesus. Teach us from your word this morning. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, I know that video uh, seemed a little strange and it's, he says a lot of words real fast. But if you don't catch anything from that video, what I want you to catch is just at the very end when he says, all of that incarnate deity. Because that's what we're going to be talking about today is the incarnate deity. The fact that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, forsook his position in heaven and descended and became man. That's the whole point. So if you don't catch anything else today, remember, let your takeaway be that God became human. Even for a brief amount of years, he became man to identify with us. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So we got your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 7 is where we're going to start. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to compare these two verses in Isaiah and then see if Jesus fulfills all these things when we see it in Matthew and Luke. And so Isaiah chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He says this, he says, And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose good. <coughs> What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of stuff packed in there. And so as we look at this, we're going to pull out a couple points from here in Isaiah and then compare them and see if these points are fulfilled in the New Testament. And so the first thing is that he tells us here that like these people have messed up. They've offended God. It says they've wearied God. They've annoyed God. Because if you look at the course of history of the church, if you look at the course of the Jewish people and Israel... It's an up and down pattern like this over and over and over again, right? They are in the garden. They're walking hand in hand with the Lord and they sin. Then they come out of that and God blesses Adam and Eve with Cain and Abel. And they offer offerings to the Lord. It says they're trying to serve the Lord. But Cain offers his second best. And then he gets mad when Abel offers his first bet and kills Abel. And the people crash again. And then we see the story of Noah where the people are starting to follow the Lord and then they fail and God floods the earth and gives Noah the boat and that's, you know, he has to make the ark and they restart mankind, basically. But then, what happens? They're here and they crash again. And then we see that the story of Joseph and all the way up to the story of the Exodus where the people were enslaved in Egypt and Moses comes and delivers them by God's power and before they even make it to the Red Sea, they're like, great, look, Pharaoh's army is bearing down on us. See, we could have just died in slavery. Why would you have to bring us to the desert to die? And then God opens the Red Sea. And they cross the Red Sea. And they wander for just a little while. And while they're wandering, they fall again. Where they're like, man, if we could just be back in slavery, we had onions there. And we had meat. And God gives them magical bread from heaven. And that's not good enough for them. They crash again. It's over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. They beg for a king, and God says, you don't need a king, I am your king. And they beg for one, and so they get Saul, and Saul seems like this godly figure, and then what does Saul do? He crashes and falls. But then, Samuel anoints David, and David's going to be the next king. And David is a man after God's own heart, and David kills Goliath and leads the people to defeat the Philistines. David is awesome, and then what happens? They go off to war and David decides to stay home and he starts looking at a naked lady on a roof and he sins. 
Over and over. That's the pattern of God's people. They rise, they fall, they rise, they fall, they rise, they fall. So when we get to Isaiah, this is what's happened. They've risen and they've fallen. And they've risen and said they've annoyed God and they've wearied Him. And so that God says, let me remind you, like I promised in Genesis, you'll see signs. There will be a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel. And he gives him his promise. So the first point, if you're a note taker, that we're going to look at and analyze is this. Is that Jesus has to be God with us. If he's going to fulfill this prophecy, if he's going to be Emmanuel, he has to be God with us. That's what that word Emmanuel means. It's not a name or proper noun. It's an adjective. It's describing who he's going to be. It's that whoever this Messiah is will be born of a virgin and he will be God incarnate with us. And so in order for Jesus to be our Savior and for, in order for Christmas to be a big deal, he has to fulfill this. He has to be God with us. So that's our first point we're going to look at. Now, if you've got your Bibles, you can flip over just a couple pages to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 2, uh, but I think the only one on the screen is actually verse 6. We'll start in verse 2 and it says this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. You have broken as the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. For the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. For from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So in order for him to fulfill this, he one has to be God with us. The second thing he has to be, is he has to be royal. He has to be royal. He has to be a king. He has to be authoritative. We see that here when it says, like of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. He has to be a king. He has to be in authority. He has to rule over people. He's coming from a kingly line. It says of the house of David. So he's going to be a descendant of the king of David. He's got a royal bloodline. So if Jesus is going to fulfill all these things, he has to be God and he has to be a king. The next day, Hebrews tells us this. We see this in the book of Hebrews because it says there that the zeal of the Lord of hosts, another translation says the zeal of the Lord of armies, is what does this. That's what keeps his kingdom going. Hebrews tells us something like that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance to the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy, it's another word for zeal, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That joy, that zeal, that's what we're talking about here. So if Jesus is going to fulfill all these things, he has to be authoritative, he has to be a king, he has to be God with us. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a paper guy, I'm an iPad, I'm not fancy like that. that <clears throat> Right? He, has to be, he has to be God with us, and he has to be royal. The third thing is that it gives him a list of names or characteristics that he has to apply to. So whoever this Messiah is, he has to apply to this risk. The first thing is, it says he has to be a wonderful counselor. Then it says he has to be a mighty God. Then it says he has to be an everlasting father. And last, it says he has to be a prince of priests. Words are hard this morning, sorry. Right? He has to be a prince of peace. When you think about this, like, this mighty God, this everlasting Father, this wonderful Counselor, this zeal that saves. In my head, all I could see was the Chronicles of Narnia. Like, any of y'all Narnia people? There's like a fit. When it comes to, like, Christian culture, there's like a 50-50 split. You're either Narnia or you're Lord of the Rings. Like you fall on one side or the other. Or you're in the third category where you're like, 
I think they're both stupid. Right? That's fine. You can do that. I'm a Narnia guy. Like, Lord of the Rings is cool, but those movies are like four hours long a piece, and they're really kind of complicated. And Narnia is pretty straightforward, right? It's like, Lion, Jesus, got it. Okay, that's the takeaway. But I think about, like, the zeal of the Lord that he talks about in Hebrews, that he goes to the cross. Like, I think of that scene in Narnia where the white witch parades into the camp. And she comes to accuse Edmund. Y'all remember this? Y'all tracking with what I'm saying here? The story where Edmund does wrong. She comes to accuse Edmund. And he has to come and pay for his sin. So he needs to be killed. And she begins to yell out and get angry and accuse accusations. And Aslan just turns and roars. And she goes, boom, and sits in her seat. That's what I'm thinking over here. Like, that's the scene I see in my head. But like, this zeal and joy and passion from the Lord that he roars and the, the enemy collapses. That's what I'm seeing here. And so, if Jesus is who he says he is, if he's going to fulfill all these things, he has to have that authority. He has to be the wonderful counselor. He has to be the mighty God. He has to be the everlasting Father. He has to be a Prince of Peace. He has to fulfill all of these things. Right? We see this, the wonderful counselor, in Isaiah 28, so just a couple chapters later, it says, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Does that apply to Jesus? Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. Mighty God, it says in Isaiah 10, just the next chapter, it says a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. I think Jesus is a mighty God? Do we see this? Is he an everlasting father? Isaiah 63, verse 16 says, For you are our father through Abraham, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer, from everlasting is your name. <clears throat> I think we can make that argument. Is he a prince of peace? John 14, 27, Jesus, his very own voice says, Peace I leave with you. May my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Does he give peace? Yeah. I think he does. I think he does. Here's why. Look at Matthew. Look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23 says this. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So does he fulfill these things? Well, the first one's like a toss-up here. Like, that's an easy one. That's like putting a ball on a tee and letting Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds, whoever you want to throw out there, Hit it off the tee and see if they can, you know, hit a line drive. That's an easy one, right? Because it tells us in Isaiah chapter 7 that it says, You shall bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. Well, then Matthew gives us that one. Like, that's the, you know, that's when the teacher gives you the, the answer to the first question where she's like, Now, the first one should be easy to you. You know, like, that's, what she, that's what's happening here. The text is giving that to us, right? Because it says in verse 23, or 22, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And then he quotes Isaiah and says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So you can put a check mark by that one. Definitively, he is God incarnate, right? He's fulfilling this prophecy. Matthew tells us, point blank, period, Jesus is God. End of the story, right? Like, people have made this argument for years and years and years and years. People in different religious beliefs have said, Well, he's a good teacher, he's a good prophet, but Jesus never claims to be God. Yeah, that's a bunch of baloney. It's right here. He vividly claims to be God. They say it of him in his birth that you shall call him Emmanuel. 
He's born of a virgin so that he's 100% God but 100% man. He's born with the ability to sin but without a sin nature because he has no earthly father. That's what we talked about a couple weeks ago in Genesis 3. That the sin nature is passed down from Adam to all men. Romans tells us that. But Jesus doesn't have an earthly father. So he's not born sinful like we are. He's born with the ability to sin. Hebrews tells us that, that we have a high priest that can sympathize with our weaknesses. He's not born sinful. He's God incarnate. So I think, I think we can definitively say, yeah, he, he fulfills that. I mean, there's a lot of other texts we could look at that, where Jesus claims to be God so clearly saying, yeah, my, I and my Father are one. There you go. Like, it's all in there. So he definitely fulfills that. Does he fulfill the second thing? Is he royal? Is he a king? Yeah. I think he is. We can see that by the fact that people come to worship him. And before he's even able to speak, when these wise men that we saw last week travel from afar, what do they say to Herod? They say, where's the child? Because we've come to worship the king of the Jews. Right? But here's the crazy part. See, what happens is we've missed it. All of the Jewish religion has missed it. They keep looking for a king to conquer. The people in this time period, they missed it because they're looking for him to overthrow Rome. They were looking for him to lead a physical army. But it was never about a physical kingdom. Because kingdoms pass away. Right? Kingdoms pass away. How many of you guys have ever been to Rome, Italy? Yeah, me neither. Right? I went to college in Rome, Georgia. It's not really uh, nowhere close. It does have one of those uh, wolf statues, which is really weird, with the little babies drinking milk from the wolf. Rome, Italy sent it to Rome, Georgia. <laughs> Why Rome, Italy did that, I'm not really sure. Because Rome, Georgia is about this big. I mean, it's tiny, right? The only thing in Rome, Georgia is downtown, Shorter College, Berry College, done. Like, that's it. There's nothing there. It's just a bunch of trees. But I've never been to Rome, Italy. But I can tell you, if you look at pictures of Rome, what are you going to see of the Roman Empire? Not a lot, right? You're going to see a bunch of rubble. You're going to see things that are broken down. The Roman Colosseum, one of the greatest pieces of architecture in the ancient world. What is the Roman Colosseum now? It's cracked and broken. Right? It's a shell of what it used to be. What happens if you go to see the Greek pantheon or the temple of Artemis in Philadelphia? Not Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Turkey. You see the temple of Artemis, you know what you're going to find? A bunch of boulders. It is nothing but a bunch of collapsed pillars. It's not there anymore. Like if you go to down, like if you go into the capital of Germany, are you going to see a bunch of architecture with swastikas on it? No, because the Nazis lost and their kingdom was defeated. Right? Like there's a reason we don't have architecture from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago that lasts forever completely preserved because history catches up to you. Things break down. Things have to be fixed. Things get destroyed because kingdoms fall and collapse. If you don't believe me, take a globe from the 1980s and see if you can name any countries in Africa that still exist. There's a lot of them that don't anymore. Like, there's countries on there that no longer exist. There's probably some of them that you didn't even know have changed recently. Like, did you realize that Sudan is two countries now? That happened in the last ten years. Why? Because empires and kingdoms fall. They fall. So Jesus was never there to establish an earthly kingdom. It was an eternal kingdom forever. That's the reason it says, like it gives us those clues in Isaiah chapter 9 where it says that it will go on forever and the throne of David will last for all of eternity and its kingdoms will be vast. Because it was never meant to be earthly. Because the kingdom is heavenly. That's what awaits us if we're in Christ. That's the point of the story. Is that he's establishing something greater than the earth could ever contain. A heavenly kingdom. So he fulfills that. Well, does it fulfill these other four promises? Is he the wonderful counselor? You bet it. He definitely is the wonderful counselor, right? How many people, even outside of Christianity, ascribe to the wisdom of Jesus? Even people like Gandhi would say that he was one of the greatest counselors and philosophers of his 
of his day. That's just earthly wisdom. How many cliches do we throw around that are rooted in Scripture and are words of Christ? Because he gives the best wisdom. But here's even crazier, is that it says that on the moment that we receive salvation, that he imparts his spirit into us. And that Holy Spirit guides us day by day and it resides inside of our heart. And as it resides inside of our heart, it guides our every action, word, and deed. The Holy Spirit is what dictates to us how we should live. It's all there. He is the wonderful counselor because he resides and sits inside of your soul. He inhabits you with his spirit. He teaches you with his wisdom. He's the greatest counselor. Right? Well, is he mighty? Is he a mighty God? Yeah. Look at, look at the story of Jesus' life. He does things that no magician could ever do. Right? You've probably seen some crazy people like, you ever watched that show, Chris Angel? That dude freaks me out, okay? Like, I'm convinced that he's like part demon or something. But then you go on YouTube and you really look and you can figure out how he does all of his tricks, like makes himself levitate and like, and then you find out it's like he's got like this rod in his pants and he somehow like, I don't know how, it's weird. Like, but there's a, there's a reason for all of it. You can just go on YouTube and you can figure out how any magician does their tricks. Ain't nobody turned water into wine lately. Right? Like, you can't find a YouTube video on how to pull that trick off. Unless you drop a food color in it and it still tastes like water, right? Like, he does some pretty incredible things. He walks on water. That's pretty incredible. He raises dead people to life. I don't see any magicians going around, like, knocking on tombstones and being like, Ooh, and dead people coming out and been dead. Right? That doesn't happen. You know, Chris Angel's not walking into the county morgue at Murphy Hospital and going, and like dead bodies sliding out of the drawers. It's not happening. Why? Because he doesn't have that power. But God does. But here's what's crazy. The mightiest thing that God ever did, period, is that he saved you and I. Amen. That's the mightiest thing he ever did. Because he took a heart of stone, a concrete, sin-filled heart, and he cracked it and broke it and pulled it apart and placed a new one in there and changed who I am. <coughs> You want to see a mighty, miraculous thing? See what God does to someone when he grabs a hold of them. And I have seen people who were in, involved in gang activity that God saves and they're different. I've seen men who were raging alcoholics who beat their wives and children, who were miraculously saved and are the kindest, gentlest, lovingest people I've ever met. Amen. Because when God enters into your condition, He changes who you are. And that's even mightier than walking on water or changing water into wine. Because He has to literally change everything about your DNA, your whole spiritual code. All of your emotions are changed and made different. Amen. Because He has that power. It's miraculous. <coughs> it's miraculous. So He is who He says He is. Sorry, I lost my notes for a second. I'm, I'm bad at my, actually not looking at notes. That or I get things really like twisted. Yeah, okay, there we go. I found them. Papers, man, papers. Right, so we know that he is definitively the wonderful counselor. We know he's definitively a mighty God. Is he an everlasting father? Does he ascribe to that? Yeah, because he's adopted us as his own. Right? He stepped into our condition and he saved us and adopted us. That's what he does. I don't know if you've ever been a part of this, if you've ever experienced adoption, if you've ever adopted anyone or seen a sibling that's been adopted. But it's not a pretty picture. It's really hard. It's really difficult. Because all of these people that are being adopted, they come with with baggage from their past life. We come with baggage from our sin that we grew up in. And then God saves us and has to change us and He adopts us as His own. It's not a smooth, easy process. For a lot of folks, you don't realize that like my oldest child, Olivia, she's not biologically my daughter. When Ellen and I met, Olivia was two years old. And I've really been the only father she's ever known. I've been the only one to have an impact into her life, to speak into her life. I'm the only guy she's ever lived with. But 
that doesn't make it easy. There's still moments that she doesn't even realize it, but we have conversations, and she has this tension built up against me, and she can't figure it out. It's because she's got all these baggage issues from the first two years of her life where she had a dad who didn't care, who didn't want to be involved, and he still doesn't really want to be involved. And it changes things. It makes it difficult. But that's what God does for us. Right? Think about this, like, how many times do we ever really thank God for adopting us as His own? For taking us into His house, into His family. For bringing us and making us part of Him. For giving us His inheritance. Oh, a lot of times we just spit in His face. We do what we want to do when we want to do it like rebellious children. But He saved us. He is the everlasting Father. Because that fathership for us never ends. It never ends for us. And Jesus has brought us that. The last thing that it says is that he's the prince of peace. Yeah. He's the prince of peace. Does Jesus bring peace? Yeah. You bet he does. He brings the peace that passes all understanding because without salvation, without hope in my life, I'd be a wreck because I can't save myself. I would lead myself into sin over and over and over and over and over again. But he brings peace to that. Luke tells us that in his gospel. So if you've got your Bibles, you can flip over or on the screen. I can find it. Yeah, verse 11. It's verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. It says this. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, listen to this, see the Prince of Peace? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Does God bring peace? Does Christ bring peace? Absolutely. In the moment of his birth, angels declared that he was bringing peace on earth and goodwill towards men. He brings peace. He always has. He always will. He is the anchor of peace. He is the only true peace. In his coming, the angels declared he is bringing peace. That's who he is. That's his character. As I was studying this and I was preparing all of this and thinking, what does this all mean? Like, That's my king, and he always has been, and he always will be. He had no predecessor, and he has no successor. There's nobody before him, and there's nobody after him. You can't impeach him. He's not going to resign. That's my king, because his is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. And then when you get through all of the forevers, amen. I read that, and I listened to that, and I kept thinking, that's, that's my king. He is king over your life and my life, whether you submit to him or not. Whether you submit to him or not. And his birth and Christmas and the story of Christmas is simply the crowning glory of his arrival, declaring the king has come. And as we looked at a couple weeks ago, that that word Noel that we say so often at Christmas, that we put on signs and we sing in songs, that that word Noel, in the Greek, it means born at Christmas. In the Latin, it means the comforter. But in the ancient Hebrew that the Old Testament was written in, Noel means long live. Long live the king. That's the king we're talking about. And he has the opportunity to reside inside of you. If you submit to him. Amen. But he's still your king whether you submit or not. Amen. I mean, we just went through this whole election series in the past year and a half, right? Where everybody rioted and said, that's not my president. Well, whether you like the dude or not, he's still the president. He's, you're still underneath him, right? So you can say all you want that God's not king and Jesus isn't my king. But guess what? He still is. And at the end of the day, he's still in authority over you whether you submit or not. So my plea to you this morning is submit to that. Submit to the kingship of the Lord. Amen. Submit to it. Because the angels have declared that He brings peace on earth and goodwill to all men. 
I love that in every story we've read in the New Testament about the birth of Christ, there's this joy and excitement where we saw that the wise men said, we want to worship Him and be glad with exceedingly great joy. And the angels here declare, it says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men. And it says that there was a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising. There's excitement and joy. For some of you, Christmas isn't an excitement filled time or a joy filled time. It's stressful. You feel strapped for cash. You feel like you've got to deal with family members you don't like. You know, you get your great aunt Bertha pinching your cheek at Christmas even though you're 45 years old. Right? Like, anybody got that grandparent? Some sweaters? I don't. My grandparents are great. None of them have ever knit me a sweater like that that I can remember. And they don't pinch my cheeks anymore. My children, on the other hand. Right? I'm, that's the beauty. When you have kids like that at Christmas, you've got little kids now, you just kind of... <laughs> you don't have to pinch me anymore. <laughs> Feel bad for my kids. Not really. Right? Like, I dealt with it for 18 years. It's your turn. Um, like, for some of you, Christmas is not a season of hope. Like, Christmas brings despair. For some of you, you are going through Christmas without a loved one. Right? And it hurts. For some of you, you're going through Christmas and you're thinking, I don't know how I'm going to provide for my family for this season. I don't know how I'm going to give gifts to my kids. For some of you, you have bad memories of Christmas, of loved ones dying or horrible accidents happening or things going wrong in your past or large fights happening with your family. Or you remember being a kid at Christmas and thinking, man, for, for a couple years I got nothing. I don't know if that's you. For me, I, I had a pretty good life. I've had a pretty good life at Christmas. But for some people, Christmas is not a season of hope. But I'm telling you this morning, Christmas is always a season of hope. No matter your earthly circumstances, no matter what it seems like in your household, no matter who you have to deal with or what heartbreak you're, you're feeling, Christmas has one point and one point only. 